bosses in video games are they themselves a form of art. They require a certain balance of charm, mechanics, memorability, and at the same time need to be fun to deal with. Boss fights are there to test the player's abilities to grasp the mechanics of the game, whether it be as simple as the typing system in Pokemon or the complexity of real-time combat in Metroid Dread. Boss fights are a delicate balance. And even more so when it comes to their story and thematic undertones. A while back I talked about Metal Gear Rising, a video game that I adore, from its music to its mechanics to its presentation and so on and so forth, but I felt as though I didn't do it really justice to the game's bosses. Well I'm fixing that mistake now, and I hope you guys enjoy this combination of all three of my boss videos. This is a video that will talk about the bosses of Metal Gear Rising in more depth. I'm Manga Common, and thank you for joining me on this analysis of the Winds of Destruction. Also, spoilers. Yeah. At least in my experience, the boss fights in any Metal Gear Solid game were the highlights of the game. Now granted, depending on which game and what control scheme you're rocking, you may disagree. But there have been plenty of videos talking about how the end from Metal Gear Solid 3 is the greatest boss fight in video game history. I think that's a little over the top, but I'd be lying if it wasn't a pretty dynamic one. Hard to sneeze at a boss that you can take out in multiple different ways, including just messing with the clock in your in-game system. This is a mission. It's not a game, it's not a sport. Oh, shut up! But here's the thing, depending on who you ask, the bosses of these games are a lot deeper than people give credit to, Rising included. Desperado's executives, the Winds of Destruction, come to mind. From their namesake to the musical themes to dialogue and backstory, the Winds of Destruction have unique traits that make them stand out from each other, but still hold together in thematic scent. You need only look at their color schemes of red, black, and metal colors. Which is obvious if you look at them and how they're part of a major corporation, but it works well and they act as a very good contrast to Ryan himself, whose major color in the game is blue, well save for... Now you're just being nasty! <laughs> But you get the point. In addition, they act as a good opposition to Raiden, and not just with fighting, but also story-wise, even with their names. The Winds of Destruction are named after cultural winds, and Raiden is... Mr. Lightning Bolt. The fuck you say to me, you little shit! The cybernetically enhanced humans are much more dangerous than the giant machines, and this is demonstrated by the fight with Metal Gear Ray. In 2018 of the Metal Gear universe, war has changed. Again, with the advent of cybernetic augmentation of human abilities, they improve the soldier's reflexes, replacing lost limbs, reaction time, and improved range of motion. They have effectively changed the tide of battle. Give these soldiers powerful weapons and the proper training and you've found the answer to Granin's dilemma. And if you don't know, Granin is the real mastermind behind Metal Gear, as established in Metal Gear Solid 3. The tank does not need a rocket. It needs something else. Look at these. Nice shoes. No. Legs. Legs that allow it to go anywhere. Just as when humans learn to walk upright. That is the real revolution in weaponry, don't you agree? The all-terrain potential of infantry, with the destructive power of artillery. That is the evolution of combat. Yes! Yes! It wide open! And that's what Metal Gear Ray's boss fight represents in that regard, the evolution of combat in the Metal Gear universe. Considering the times where you actually do fight against Metal Gears in the Solid series, in those games you're forced to fight with more meager weapons like rocket launchers, or to use your own Metal Gear to fight them. But in Metal Gear Rising, Ryan is capable of fighting this huge monstrosity like it's nothing. The same with Jetstream Sam in the DLC. This is actually highlighted very well in the song Rules of Nature. If you can stop headbanging for a few seconds and listen to the lyrics, you'll hear stuff like this. Metal Gear Ray is a relic of the past in Rising. 
It's merely being used as a means to delay Raiden from chasing after Sundowner after he kidnaps a high-ranking official. Times have changed. The Middle Gear is officially an obsolete weapon. It's a matter of survival of the fittest, Darwin's theory of evolution. In a sense, Middle Gear Ray is passing up the torch on the battlefield, and it's something that actually has a parallel to the actual real world of combat evolution. Blunt objects gave way to swords, sword gave way to guns, and guns gave way to more technological advances and modern warfare such as... <laughs> That, to me, is why Metal Gear Ray is probably the best way to start off this game. To show the player that the giant mechs of previous Metal Gears aren't the real threat, but rather the soldiers. They are the focused. They are the ones that steal the show. Now, I'm going to talk about Wolf later, but I'd like to focus on the more human characters first, since that's more of the point of this video. And I'd like to think I did a decent job of Wolf's themes in the video I put out, but hey, I did make another video and that's going to come up later, so... But for now, Mistral. The Northern Cold Winds, more specifically, the cold northern winds in the French Alps. She is a French Algerian orphan who shares a similar origin to that of Raiden's childhood, orphaned thanks to the Algerian Civil War of the 1990s. She saw her parents' killers. But I butchered those fuckers. Because of that, Mistral found her calling. She was good at killing. Still, even though she was good at that, she still questions why she would fight for a cause that she didn't really have a choice in. At least until... I met him. The battle with Mistral is a battle of identity, as even her music can attest to that. Its lyrics talk about a constant stranger who can only consider the battlefield her home, and later on this will also go to reflect Raiden as he becomes more accepting of his own past and uses it to fulfill his goal. Pardon me if I butcher the name, because for some reason whenever I talk about foreign names I can't help myself but butcher them. Le Trenja is the weapon of choice by this deadly woman, which is confirmed reference by Albert Camus's book. Which, for those who don't know, and I was one of them, is a story about a French-Algerian man named Mersault. If you want a small synopsis for the book, spoilers I guess? I'm too smart to read. I need action. It's about Mersault and his journey of killing a person. The before and after. I don't know, I haven't read it in full, so maybe there's a lot more symbolism and comparison, but from what I understand, there's a bit of a reference to the benign indifference of the universe, where Mistral was pretty much killing for no good reason, at least until she met Stephen Armstrong, who gave her her life's purpose. After her defeat, she realized what it felt to die for a cause, and expressed her wish towards someone to continue the fight due to her belief that he wouldn't fail. And her final words... I think what I find most interesting about Mistral is the parallel to Raiden. A good boss should have some sort of connection to the main character, especially when there's so few bosses in Metal Gear Rising, considering the fact there isn't really a personal connection. Save for two, there needs to be another reason to have a connection. A connection between both the player character and the boss helps to incite a bit of tension between the two. In Mistral's case, it's the similar past that she and Raiden had, child soldiers. And how if things turned out differently, Raiden could have ended up on the same path as Mistral. And later on, when Jack the Ripper appears, Mistral was wasn't too far off. They are more similar than she first thought. Monsoon, named after the eastern wet storms, more specifically the Southeast Asian variety. He is a non then war survivor with Cambodian origins, having survived the Cambodian genocide and eventually becoming a gang member that had ties to human trafficking and drug trade. Monsoon's philosophy is one of nihilism, the rejection of all moral principles, in the belief that life is meaningless. A philosophy carved into his body as stated when he claims, Parent, but an effective teacher. Its final lesson is carved deep in my sight. That this world and all its people are diseased. Free will is a myth. Religion is a joke. It's controlled by something. Means. The DNA of the soul. 
People often like to make jokes at the language that Monsoon says means the DNA of the soul. But there's a lot of truth to that. There's a phrase that's uttered that if you say a lie enough times, it becomes the truth. And in a sense, that's the same vein as memes. Richard Dawkins, a world-renowned biologist, coined the term in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. To give a simplified explanation, a meme is essentially a unit of cultural evolution. An idea and a concept. They are essentially the DNA of the soul, and really, if you want a more simplified version... Expose someone to anger long enough, they become a carrier. Hate leads to hate, and it's a sad aspect of our modern day internet culture that we're seeing this happen right before our eyes, and most people don't even know it. Monsoon's nihilism can even be attributed to his design. One of the most defining features of Monsoon is his segmented body. His cyborg body is probably the most unique out of all the other bosses in the game, let alone the cyborg. Going so far to further segment his body kind of speaks to me that he really doesn't value the aspect of humanity even his own humanity. After all, in the grand scheme of things, he's just a man, a single solitary person who's nothing more than a tool. Why should he care about his body status? So long as it allows him to fight, survive, and kill his opponents, that's all that matters. I feel that the stains of time really indicates this notion as the song that talks about nature running its course, using rain in an attempt to wash away the anger. But it's useless. Monsoon is a man who gave up his hope, his humanity, things that make him human. In the mud and sinking deeper to a peaceful life. And when that realization sets in... Just like a light sprinkling of rain, it warps into a violent storm in a desperate attempt to erase the man's suffering. A husk of a human with no hope left within his body, so he fights. And fights. As opposed to Mistral, whose encounter was a question of Raiden's past, Monsoon's battle was to question Raiden's identity. Raiden viewed himself as a protector of the weak that his sword was a tool of justice. Monsoon questioned the inherent nature of Raiden, that Raiden is a naturally violent individual. Gee, I wonder what gave him that idea. Well, Monsoon does get his wish. He gets to see Raiden's true nature. And after an epic fight, the Monsoon was put down. Brutally murdered in a rainstorm, according to his own ideology of the strong preying on the weak. And he's actually pretty fine with that. Don't be ashamed. It's only nature running its course. Your means end here. No, I passed one to you. Sure as the sun will rise, the slaughter will continue. No. I return to the earth. Wind blows. Rain falls. The strong prey on the weak. All is as it should be. Wind blows. Rain falls. The strong prey on the weak. All facts of life. And when you think about it, Humans are slaves to their natures. And like he said, he passed a meme on to Raiden. The will to survive. The will to fight. And to use his past as an extension of himself. I think it's time for Jack to let her rip.
sundowner, dry California winds, and one of the more prominent characters in Metal Gear Rising. Unlike Mistral or Monsoon, Sundowner is a character that the player is introduced to quite early in the game. Being one of the two Winds of Destruction who appeared before Raiden and set up the events of the game. An American soldier who accepted his bloodlust and is a warmonger, as he stated, Give war a chance! No. The Californian Wildfire. Which is funny because he's actually from Alabama. Sweet home, Alabama. Which is actually telling since his name doesn't derive from his origin of location. He was named after his actions on the battlefield. That he would leave his enemies in bloody piles, their blood streaming and looking like the blazing setting sun. The invasion of Panama, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and Afghanistan. These were all conflicts that Sundowner was a part of. Fictionally, of course. He came from a poor family and couldn't afford college, so he joined the American military, and he was good at his job. Maybe a bit too much since he was investigated for war crimes. The guy obviously has a sick fascination with war and fighting. The only reason why he left the battlefield for some time was because he was hit with an IED, an improvised explosive device. It's what led to him to get a cyborg body, and it's represented in his weapon, the Bloodlust two high-frequency machetes that can combine into a scissor-like weapon, representing his demented drive for violence. If you were to look at these three winds of destruction, they represent the parts of Raiden. Mistral was the signifier for Raiden's past, Monsoon was the delusion of Raiden's present, and Sundowner represents a possible future for Raiden. One of Sundowner's speeches alludes to how humans are naturally violent, and considering that Raiden had just accepted Jack the Ripper as his past, and using it to fight against Desperado, it's not outside the realm of possibility that Raiden could easily slip into a similar role as Sundowner. Or could've. Red Sun. The theme for Sundowner represents this. A red sun over paradise. In Japanese culture, this phrase supposedly refers to a blood-stained night after a war, but changing the bloody moon into a red sun, a change in the world's order, humans tarnishing the natural beauty with their actions, with their fighting, with their blood. <laughs> to Sundowner. To Sundowner, he believes that humans are naturally violent, and to an extent, they are. I mean, I'm not going to claim otherwise in a game where we see Raiden do this. Now, you may be wondering, he's a full-blooded American. Why are you bringing up Japanese stuff? Well, here's another thing. When you look at Sundowner, his overall style of combat is similar to that of a Japanese Shogun's armor. And before you fight Sundowner, you have to go through a Japanese garden inside the Desperado building. However, this to me is nothing more than a front. While Sundowner seemingly isn't a pushover in the throes of battle, this is nothing more than a protective shield to show how weak he truly is. Sundowner is a hypocrite, and one who will do what he can to justify his actions. He claims that he and Desperado slash World Marshal are only suppliers of war, they don't create the market for the war economy, that they're only the ones who give the people their weapons. But that's full of crap. Desperado's plan, under Armstrong's guidance, was to instigate a terrorist incident while the US president was in Pakistan in order to create another war on terror, creating the market for war. It's a flimsy justification, a shield as it were. Business ain't been the same since they shut down SOP. A clean break from the war economy. Huh. Well, some of us lack that economy. How's an honest warmonger supposed to make a living? You can even attribute the fact that he gained his wealth through the war times in order to get out of the poor state as a means of justification for his actions. Even bloodlust, his weapons can attribute to this. Machetes have frequently been used in bloody uprisings and revolutionary wars, and with how Sundowner's weapons could be used, they're more than likely leave the attacked person alive but cause them to bleed out. Fitting for a man who claims to be in it for the money but takes obvious pleasure in the cruelty. Even more so when you fight against Sundowner, amongst all the winds of destruction, he's the one who fights the dirtiest. Mistral had the dwarf geckos that she ripped the arms out to help her, and used them to distract Ride and throw them at him. Monsoon, however, didn't have goons in the boss fight. He used things like the smoke screen and his magnetic power to throw debris at Raiden. Sundowner 
Well, he's on a different level with his underhanded tactics. His arena has attack helicopters will attack Raiden while fighting him. His shields explode when you make contact with them or cut them in the wrong way. He'll summon goons to fight you. He'll resort to battlefield acquisition when the fight starts to turn against him, meaning... And when he's about to lose completely, he just goes... Fuck it! And has the helicopters attack and destroy the helipad in an attempt to kill Raiden. These are the tactics of a cowardly man. Granted, I'm not saying they're bad battle tactics. You do whatever you can in order to win a fight. That being said... With an explosion to his back, Sundowner gets cut down. For all his dirty tricks and cruelty, a man like him loses to Raiden. Sundowner's theme is about the world being set on fire and is killed because an explosion propelled him towards Raiden. In a sense, Raiden slashed the possibility of becoming a man like Sundowner, a man who was willing to make excuses for his horrible actions, a man willing to justify his cruelty, a man willing to say that kids are naturally cruel but grow out of it. Kids, you can mold, manipulate it to perform in all kinds of atrocities. And there's nothing like a good atrocity War going. There was one thing that Sundowner was right about, though. Truly a sad fact of our world. We now come to my favorite boss. Jetstream Sam, Samuel Rodriguez. Powerful free roaming wind. And among the Winds of Destruction, Sam is the one that sticks out the most, both in design and thematics. He's also not technically a Wind of Destruction, but hey, I'm going to refer to him as that because it's easier. He's the first of the quote-unquote Winds of Destruction that Ryan actually fights and loses. Jetstream Sam has another name, Minwano, Brazilian Cool Wind, and marks the independence of the other Winds of Destruction. Hell, Sam isn't even a cyborg. He only wears a cybernetic suit and has an artificial arm. If you take notice of Sam's health in the boss fight, he's got the lowest amount of health amongst the bosses in the game. Granted, his fight makes it a bit harder to hit him, but it's something to really consider when you take a few moments to analyze his boss fight with a critical eye. Jetstream Sam, despite his actions of killing people, he doesn't use dirty tricks. He could have stopped Ryan's trek to stop Armstrong by killing everyone at the airport base, but he didn't. He waited for Raiden to come on the stolen motorcycle to stop Raiden through an honorable duel. A fun fact, that motorcycle that Raiden stole in order to get to the airbase was actually Sam's. <laughs> Sam is someone who, while has his own morals and code, is a man who was broken down. Before he joined World Marshal, he wasn't a man of righteous justice. He didn't fight for the weak. No, he did pursue a sense of justice, thinking that his blade could cut and eliminate the corruption of the world. He wandered the globe fighting against criminal organizations in order to test his skills, barely taking the fight seriously, yet still managing to take down these criminals single-handedly. And he did it without taking a single blow. In the DLC where you play as him, he was able to take down Metal Gear Ray before he had his artificial arm, a feat that Ryan was only able to accomplish after he'd gotten to cybernetic enhancements. Sure, you could attribute the nano suit to some of Sam's abilities, but he still has plenty of skill and swordsmanship to his own. Like, like Raiden, Raiden, Sam, Sam was, fueled was fueled by revenge. By revenge. His, his father, the master of the Rodriguez New Shadow School, was killed by, was one, killed of by one of his pupils with ties to a local drug cartel. So Sam so trained and took his revenge, and took his revenge. All he had was the Mermasa, was empty. a sword left him. by his father his to wandering him. Soul. And his wandering soul, he only knows how to kill, he knows how to kill. Not, not why he kills. Sam! Thanks for coming in. What's your game, Armstrong? Gonna talk me to death? <laughs> like I said, son, time for your final interview. It wasn't until Armstrong and Monsoon essentially planned an interview with Sam, with Armstrong defeating Sam and taking his arm, that things changed for the wandering southern wind. <laughs> Oh, 
Not bad, son. But... Like Monsoon said... Losing a limb or two... Won't stop us. The hell? The job's yours. Welcome aboard. Demoralized at his inability to defeat such a corrupted force, Sam abandoned his path of justice. Sam believed that things like ideals had no place on the battlefield, with the strong and those who took victory had the right to claim what was and wasn't justice. Hmm, self-taught, and not half bad. Still. <laughs> Raiden's ideals of justice remind him of his past self, causing friction between the two, with Sam constantly mocking Raiden's pursuit of justice and protecting the weak. Ah, now I see. You deny your weapon its purpose. Raiden denying his weapon its purpose. One could say that Sam saw himself in Raiden, and it got to the point that Raiden actually made Sam question if Armstrong's goals of creating a war to end war was really the right thing to do. <laughs> Two years I've been working towards this, and on the last day, Blondie has me doubting the whole thing. We'll leave it up to fate then, shall we, Wolfie? A duel to the death. May the best man win. Sam. I cut him down, and that's that. Back to a regularly scheduled international incident. But if he beats me, if I die here, the lock on my blade will disable after a couple hours. What happens after that is up to you, Wolfie. Jetstream Sam is a callback to old western and samurai films, duels against honorable opponents that are a staple in those kinds of films, wild west cowboys that would only get into gun duels with people they felt were skilled enough to challenge them. There wouldn't be a thrill otherwise. Hell, you need only look at the lyrics of The Only Thing I Know For Real to see that. Heck, when you start the duel with Sam, a single tumbleweed just so happens to billow past Raiden and Sam as they're about to begin their duel. They are a staple of this kind of cinematography. Along with that, you have a red and gold sunset, which got its color from the high altitude clouds and atmospheric dust. And if you want to take a more close at the Japanese side, there's a Shinto rivalry between the lightning and wind gods, with Sam having a reference to the winds and Raiden well, Raiden's name of that of a Japanese god of thunder and lightning. I think you guys can put two and two together. Sam represents the loser whose defeat in service to Armstrong essentially turned him into a nihilistic international terrorist who supported World Marshal until his encounter with Raiden, who made him question and reaffirm his sense of ideals, identity, and motivation. Sam is another path that Raiden could have taken, where he becomes a husk of his former self, having cast aside his justice to take up another's, and as such, he acts as a good foil to Raiden. The two are very similar in multiple ways, especially their fighting style. However, Sam was someone who gave up his why to fight, and only focused on the how to kill. And if you notice that when you knock out his sword from his hands, the lyrics to his theme song stop playing. He's not able to give his all in the fight, his identity, his life is just for him to fight, and without his blade, he's unable to feel alive. Even so, unlike other bosses, Sam's fight is straightforward. It's a test of skill, not one of trickery or underhanded tactics. He fights Raiden one-on-one, -on -one, a stark contrast to that of the other bosses in the game up to this point. The other most notable thing about Sam is his death. Out of all the other deaths of the bosses, 
He is the most honorable and humane, being a stab to the chest. Despite their conflicting ideals and their opposition, Raiden refrains from cutting Sam into small pieces like he has with the other Winds of Destruction, even removing the blood from Sam's sword and sheathing it. Raiden shows he has respect for the fallen warrior. Sam is probably what I consider to be a great rival in with a similar skill set to that of the player character, a connection of sorts to said character, and even allowing the chance for people to respect him as a person. Jetstream Sam was a man of his own justice, beaten down by the cruelty of the world and had given up his own sense of right and wrong when he was effectively scarred for the remainder of his life by the loss of Armstrong's overwhelming power. His is the story of a man being broken and seeing another man who used to be like him stand up against the same forces that broke him. Raiden used Sam's Muramasa. Raiden used Sam's sword against Armstrong as a passing of the torch. Where Sam surrendered his own justice, Raiden took up the blade and defeated oh, the very man so that sure. Sam could not. And besides, this isn't my sword. Come on! Okay. Let's dance. I know. Honestly, if you're watching this, congratulations! We managed to get to the point where I've been asked to create another video about Metal Gear Rising. More specifically, about the three bosses that I didn't cover in my initial video. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like I was going to ignore them outright. But when you've got a DLC boss, a giant mech that's a branch off the glory that is Senator Armstrong and Blade Wolf, only one of those has really seemed to be interesting enough to talk about. That being said, I'm forced to eat crow because there's more to these three bosses. So. Like I said before, the bosses of Metal Gear Rising are deeper than you think. So, buckle the f up, little doggy. I'm gonna be completely honest. I wasn't expecting so many people to bring up Kasim. Check the internet lately. The memes. And well, sure, why not? Kasim, the Desert Storm. A former marine before he was turned cyborg. He's actually the boss in Metal Gear Rising's DLC where you play as Blade Wolf. This is honestly a little bit different from when I talked about the main bosses and even with Armstrong because I had more fun time when I was able to compare and contrast the bosses against Raiden. That isn't to say I can't do the same with Kasim, but there aren't a lot of scenes with him. But he is an interesting character based on what we can see. And hey, if Armstrong can be an interesting character with only about two scenes that actually have him, then hey, anything's possible with Kasim too. For example, Kasim was originally planned to be in the main game. According to Yuji Korikado, he was also going to be a member of the Winds of Destruction in the main game as well. But he was cut before production began. Still, he is considered to be the fourth Wind of Destruction, and since so many people wanted me to talk about him, he was apparently really popular. Now to make it clear, Kasim isn't exactly what you'd call a villain of sorts. I guess, maybe? During the DLC, we learn that his goal is to bring freedom to the people of Abkhazia, even if he has to spill blood to do so. In a sense, that's what separates him from the rest of the Winds of Destruction on a fundamental level. Aside from being a different kind of cyborg, he's the only member of the Winds of Destruction who believes what he's doing is the right thing. Granted, his idealism is what makes him a compelling character because it also makes him a hypocrite, because he's forcing that freedom onto others and using his might in order to do so rather than to help others. This can also be applied to Blade Wolf, in which Kasim is a good foil to, but we'll get to that in a few seconds. Back to the hypocrisy, it's interesting that Kasim preaches about freedom, but the whole point of the Wolf DLC is to get his own freedom, and obviously as a boss battle, Kasim stops Wolf. So does the man truly believe in freedom, or is it just a convenient excuse to get him a fresh coat of blood on his chainsaw axe? Regardless, it's also a fun little fact that Kasim in the world of Metal Gear Rising was a part of the Second Iraq War which ties into a supposed force of freedom, since one of the greatest criticisms of that war on the US was the amount of force that was used in that combat. Am I even allowed to talk about the Iraq War on YouTube nowadays? Oh well, in any case, Kasim is actually a very good foil for Blade Wolf, 
Aside from the themes of freedom that I'll get more into when we reach the Blade Wolf section of this video. Both characters are on Desperado's leash, with Kasim being led with the prospect of freedom while Wolf has the threat of his memory being erased, both use chainsaw toothed weapons, and if you look at the heads of Kasim's mech body you'll see that they resemble Wolf's original head. There's more to the boss fight as well, not only does the fight have this dynamic fall between the two, I'd say it's a symbolic of the ending when Blade Wolf rips Kasim out of his mechanical body. Quite literally, actually, since Kasim is grafted to the bulky mechanics that he's using. It has this tiny cruel irony, if you ask me, as Wolf grants Kasim a freedom of a different kind. The freedom from life! Oh God, oh God! Kasim is also obnoxious, at least to Mistral. Hell, for her, the whole point of the Blade Wolf DLC is mostly a convoluted plan to have Blade Wolf kill the guy. If you look at Kasim's fighting style, his Desert Storm moniker is represented quite well as his combat style has him using the thrusters to gather speed and bum rush his opponents. And if you know anything about Desert Storms, while they can whip around sporadically, they are very dangerous and can lower visibility and cause debris to be whipped around. You can even see that aspect when Kasim jumps into the air, brings down his axe, and causes the concrete to spike up, allowing Wolf to sneak around it and get a surprise attack in. And man, Kasim can take a chainsaw to the chest really well. I guess we should talk about his theme song next. The hot wind is blowing. Right off the bat with the lyrics of the song, we're really seeing a side of Kasim's character. He's just a soldier, he's cruel, and he can only follow orders. No matter the cost, no matter if it just goes against his belief of freedom. Kasim is a simple man, a soldier who's just doing as he's told. He believes what he's doing is justified, and he's using that to excuse any cruel actions he may have. Whether he knows it or not is irrelevant to the character, because Kasim believes in his cause, and that's demonstrated that he shows pride within the name that he has, as a wind of destruction. To point something out, much like a lot of the other bosses in the game, the lyrics don't actually appear at the beginning of the fight. No, they start when Kasim is about to rev up his final attack, and Wolf is slicing through his robotic body apart. Which, if you ask me, is a little telling of something else. Mm -hmm. Most of the other bosses that follow that trend of music will often have the lyrics show up at the final stage of their fight, not in the final desperation of attacks. The music in Metal Gear Rising is not used carelessly. If the game has a reason to change up the music, it does so for a reason. Now, I can only speculate on this with my interpretation, but the way I see it, there are two reasons why this choice is including in the lyrics. Aside from just being pure badass to have that happen during the scene. The first of this could be a reflection of Kasim's part, how he viewed his actions throughout his life and that his prize of wind destruction is basically being trampled upon by this mangy mud of a character. Mangy goddamn son of a... There's always been this theme of soldiers throughout the entire Metal Gear series. What are you really after? A world where warriors like us are honored as we once were, as we should be. That was Big Boss's fantasy. It was his dying wish! When he was young, during the Cold War, the world needed men like us. We were valued then. We were desired. But things are different now. With all the lies and the hypocrites running the world, war isn't what it used to be. Are you familiar with big chunks? It's true. In our modern day society, the value of a soldier in the public eye isn't what it used to be. Soldiers were seen as modern day knights a long time ago. And then, as reality began to sink in, the cruel actions of the everyday soldier became more and more apparent to the public. And as Armstrong did say, oh, Relax, Jack. It's a war on terror. We're not out to kill civilians. Extremists! Lawless gangs! Madmen! Kasim is a soldier doing what he's doing for freedom. 
and who's going to be against freedom? What kind of anti-American BS is that you're spouting? There's always an excuse. There's always a reason to justify the horrible actions. There's always... something. Even in his final words, Kasim still clings onto the excuse that he kept on spouting. Piece of shit! Oh, what about the freedom of this whole country? Oh. Freedom cannot be forced on others. It must be earned for oneself. And he denies that Wolf says to him that freedom can't be forced upon others. Now let's talk about my second reading of the song, and how that's a bit more similar to a theme of Jetstream Sam's theme. The only thing I know for real. After Kasim's death, the Winds of Destruction need to hire a replacement for him. And who better than Jetstream Sam? The whole point of Sam's song was a loss of identity and knowing only how to fight, as a soldier of sorts. Kasim, despite his false understanding of freedom, did have a motive to keep him going. So it's interesting to think about how his replacement is the direct opposite of Kasim. One more thing to note about is Kasim's death. Despite Wolf not being Raiden, there's symbolism in Kasim being ripped out of his mech suit and sliced into salsa. Much like how a piece of trash is caught in the wind, Kasim was thrown helplessly in the air and... Godspeed, Kasim! The Desert Storm! You know, I debated if I want to talk about Excessless on here, because while I was able to get some meaning out of Metal Gear Ray, I thought the same couldn't be said of Excessless. Boy, was I wrong, and I'm glad I was. The first thing we need to look at is its name, Excelsius. And I'm pretty sure I'm butchering its name, but, uh, give me a little break. Making the mother of all omelets here, Jack. Can't fret over every egg. Which by definition means high or lofty, and it's also the name of a species of a dinosaur, the Apatosaurus. This version of Metal Gear was specifically made to overwhelm cyborgs in the Metal Gear universe, which had become much more prominent on the battlefield. So in layman's terms, BRING A BINGER GUN! It's fun to think about it because Excelsius is actually pretty representative of Metal Gear Rising itself, since when the game first came out, people denounced it for not being true Metal Gear, since there was more of a focus on high-octane action instead of the stealth that the series was known for up to that point. My smart ass aside, considering the game has its characters and a continuation of the story of Metal Gear Solid, I have to disagree with that. But back to Excelsius, it too was not on Metal Gear. If you listen to the codex talking about it, it turns out it was given the title of Metal Gear simply because of a promotional reason to make it sell better. Oh gee, where have I heard that before? A new updated version of something that people really like given the name in order to elicit interest in the obviously inferior product? Wow! Joking aside, I can totally see Excelsius being effective against most combat cyborgs. Not only does the thing have massive weapons it can use, but in a more domesticated area, it doesn't need to worry about seeking solo targets since it can easily just wipe out the entire town if it wanted to. Granted, one cyborg is able to take it out. Then again, Raiden's just a badass in this game, so... Let her rip. And now we get to the important part of what I want to talk about. The theme song of Excelsius. Collective Consciousness. And to be fair, it's more of a secondary theme to Sander Armstrong, since not only does he pilot Excelsius while the song plays, but it's also the song that plays when you fight Armstrong during Jetstream's DLC. The message is pretty blatant, that people will often throw away their free will in order to have a safe life. Why bother thinking for yourself? Why not let the government take over and provide for you? Needless to say, in today's culture, it cuts a bit too close for my comfort that people are willing to surrender what little freedoms they have, just so they can be comfortable. Ignoring the others that value freedom that they have.
Welcome Maxims for those with no faith, without guiding principles of their own. Give yourself up to the hole, no need to better yourself. You're American! You're number one! It's a thought process that has been plaguing our internet landscape for years now. People don't want to actually work for success. They don't want to lose what they have. They don't want to risk comforts. Even all it takes is a simple thought to unwind it. They'd rather just be a collective of something bigger. Why bother thinking for yourselves? Why not let the politicians do the thinking for you? Why not let the big media companies do that stuff for you? Why not let YouTubers who have hundreds of thousands of followers tell you what to think? After all, they're the good guys. They wouldn't lie to you, right? Humans are weak. You, me, everyone. It's easy for us to take the easy way out in our world. Life is pain and we can lift the burden even just a little bit. It's more preferable than suffering. Right? It's the right thing to do, correct? Who cares if you're seen as a tool by those who see you as useful puppets? They don't care about you and just use fancy words and empty promises just to control you. So, what do you do? Do you just give up your freedom? Do you think you're smart for choosing this path? What good is an intellect if you can't use it? Exterminate! I hope you guys have realized there's a theme going on in this video. Freedom. It's a subject that many of us take for granted, and ironically enough, as I said before, there are those who are happy to give up their freedoms for safety even if they take away the freedoms of others in the process. They don't care. I stated in my original video on bosses that Jetstream Sam is my favorite boss in the game. But he's not the most important boss, nor is he my favorite character in Metal Gear Rising. No, no. That honor goes to Blade Wolf. For myself. As a boss character, Blade Wolf is the first same size boss you can actually face that doesn't prevent you from actually winning. So yeah, I don't count the first encounter with Sam as a boss fight. Anyway, as the first boss that you can encounter in the game after Ryan's updated look, Wolf certainly makes the entrance. Show yourself. Like, aside from Jetstream Sam's shit-eating grin, Wolf here has the most impactful introduction onto a boss fight, even starting up the running gag of the game where Raiden's chin gets buzzed on. It should be obvious, but Wolf is the one boss that Raiden can interact the most, because after you slice and dice him, Raiden gets docked to fix him up. Raiden gets docked to fix him up. And I gotta say, while I wish there was more chemistry outside the codec, the codecs are plenty entertaining since most of the time we got Wolf being a straight man to Raiden. Hmm, good boy. I will ignore the condescension and take that as a compliment. You are welcome. And while the humor can be dry at points, if you actually do the codex, you can get a good grasp of the two's relationship and Wolf's character. And you learn a bit more of Wolf's past and how he works. As a machine, I had no contract and no rights. I was kept in the dark. On the other hand, 
Some of them treated me like a pet or as a child. Just as a parent passes on their memes to a child, so I was exposed to numerous influences. Do not be distracted by the advertisements. You are not here as a tourist. Sure. I'll just buy a quick souvenir or two for Rose and that'll be it. Raiden, we must hurry. Remind me to teach you about sarcasm sometime. I understand your attempts at humor. I simply do not find them entertaining. Even though he's an AI, Wolf's programming was designed to resemble that of a human brain. Learning, so that's why you get him to use words such as I think or perhaps, because even though he's a machine, he's one that was made to be like human. And he can be a dick to ride in. Uh, I guess we don't really have time to catch up. It does turn out, though, that Wolf feels that he owes Ryan his life, and learned a lot from Ryan during their travels. Hell, there's no programming that Wolf has to follow Raiden, and Raiden has even outright stated that Wolf can leave whenever he wants. It's actually part of the reason why I like Wolf and Raiden as two characters. Wolf is as close as a human as a robot can get, and has a sense of honor to him, meanwhile Raiden has pretty much given up his humanity quite a few times in the past. Wolf, however, has one fatal flaw. He wasn't cruel enough like a human. Holy moly! I mean, that's debatable if you ask me, but hey, who am I to say otherwise? You also need to remember that Raiden kind of has a thing against AIs, even at one point alluding to the Patriots who, in the world of Metal Gear Solid, had used him as a tool for their goals. Actually, there is something I have been meaning to tell you, but I just couldn't. I think you should know, though. On Saturday morning last week, I saw a guy leaving Rosemary's room. So Raiden still has a distrust towards artificial intelligence. But eventually, Raiden trusts Wolf and gives the doggo true moral considerations even going so far that Wolf has the right to choose his own path. Much more than what the, his creators, Desperado, ever gave Wolf. When you consider the context of these two characters, it's actually pretty deep, especially when you consider that Raiden also knows what it's like to be nothing more than a tool for those who are above him and treat his life as nothing more than disposable garbage. But the real beauty of Blade Wolf is the fact that his story is following the themes of freedom. And despite the numerous conversations on and what man uses that freedom for is weird, Wolf determined that there isn't an easy answer for why men raise their swords on the battlefield for freedom. And until you actually meet him, freedom was just a word to Wolf. He had no way to disobey orders, or else Wolf's memories, the whole of him, would be deleted. Even the DLC when he attempts to escape, it was nothing more than a cruel test from Mistral to get rid of Kasim. You deceived me. Such a mighty intellect, indeed. Then I have lost. Shake. So let's talk about his boss fight. Wolf is actually what you'd call a glass cannon, meaning he can dish out a lot of damage if his attacks hit you, but he can't really take a lot of damage in return. This makes sense when you consider he's the first official boss of the game after Ray, but I'd argue that he's much more dangerous than Ray, especially with his attacks. Take for example his strongest move, in which Wolf pins down Raiden before stabbing him with his chainsaw. That's an attack that can rip off a quarter of your health on normal difficulty. Blade Wolf is what you can call a wake-up call boss. He is supposed to test the player's abilities with the new mechanics of the game early on so they can understand that these are important. Parrying, manual blade mode, zandatsu, or even the lock-on for some cases. Hell, I've even seen some players lose to him because they just treated Metal Gear Rising as a simple hack and slash with no actual complexity to it. Your intellect is far below. Wolf is meant to be easy, but he can wreck your shit if you're not ready. There's a trope of summoning minions to do your dirty work with bosses, and most of the time when you watch videos that talk about this trope, people hate these kinds of bosses since it weakens the flair and style of them. But that being said, I think it works here since not only is Wolf one of the earlier bosses in the game, but also because it works with his theme. Wolf is a... I mean, he's a wolf. The leader of the pack. Having his underlings appear to fight Raiden is something that the leader would give orders to. Now, granted, the real star of this boss fight is the music here! I My Own Master Now is a song that I hold close to my heart. It's one of the reasons that's pushed me to do more and more of these kind of videos since I, and I would assume a lot of you, are feeling locked down because of life. 
held back by those who stand above us. The chains of reality holding us down from our potential. A lot of us feel chained up, forced to do things we don't want to, whether it be from responsibilities, the world itself, or someone who would rather see you as a pet. It's unfulfilling in life, even more so when you're locked into something that actively pounds on you as a person, like a chained up beast. It's soul crushing, and you desire something more, like a wolf hungry on the hunt. It's a desire that wolf howls to the air, something that we all desire deep down. True freedom. To not be led by those who don't care for us as people, so we need to plan for ourselves, breaking the chains that bind us down and hold us back from our true potential. Sure, there will be pain because of this, but nothing ventured and nothing gained. You need to take a chance and become your own master now. You can't just rely on someone else to make the world better for you. Leave the losers who are holding you back behind. Become your own master now! It's not gonna be easy. But nothing that's worth living ever is. Every day you will be in a fight. You won't come out of it unscathed, but it's something you need to do for yourself to find true happiness, to find your true potential, to become free. This is a lesson that Wolf had to learn for himself in his DLC, and it wasn't until he challenged Raiden that he actually did get his freedom. I mean, sure, he was sliced and diced into little bits, but throughout the rest of the game, he made a choice to stay by Raiden's side, because throughout the arduous journey, he followed Raiden on, he grew as a character, and funnily enough, became more human as a result. Blade Wolf is an important character, not just in the game of Metal Gear Rising, not just as a kick-ass boss fight, but as a character that really spoke to me as a person. Someone who taught me that just how beautiful freedom can be, how easily it can be stripped away from you, and how hard the world can be when you don't have said freedom. And Metal Gear Rising is an important game as well. Sure, it's a really fun game where you can slice people into shiitake mushrooms, but it's a game that culturally is very important. But people like to write it off as the funny meme game. My name is Monsoon of the Sussy Imposters. What the fuck? Emergency meeting. Sure, you can enjoy the memes and the funny videos that are made from it. I never want to take that away from anyone. But I'm just here to point out that Metal Gear Rising can be an important game if you just look a little deeper at even just the music. But ultimately, Metal Gear Rising spreads its message in the way that it should be with games. Through subtlety, through its music, through its characters, through its action. It doesn't lecture you unless you want it to. And even then, it can be amazingly entertaining. And with that, I thank you for your time. If you made it to this point in the video, type in the comments, I'm my own master now. Well, if it isn't Saucy Jack. Just a little too late, as usual. Nationalism. Unilateralism! Materialism! Welcome maxims for those with no faith, without guiding principles of their own. Not too long ago, I talked about Metal Gear Rising, and hopefully before this video comes out, I'll have talked about the bosses of that game, the Winds of Destruction, and how I believe they're deeper bosses than what a lot of people give credit for. However, I left out one boss in particular, Senator Steven Armstrong. I want to make it clear with this video that Armstrong is probably one of my favorite final bosses in all of gaming, and that's a very big achievement considering he doesn't have all that much screen time in Metal Gear Rising. 
Before his boss battle, Armstrong only shows up on a record surveillance feed in Mexico. And we do get a little insight into his character where he's a cold, calculating, even willing to throw away lives of people. This video, I want to take some time to discuss Armstrong as a character, as a boss, what he represents to me, and various other little tidbits. So, hi! I'm Manga Common, and let's go! Ugh, that was so cringy. Who are you, and how did you get this number? I have a It's important to start off this video by talking about how Armstrong is the culmination of skills that you learn throughout the game of Metal Gear Rising. Rising can be a very mechanically steep or simple game, and it depends on the player's playstyle. But in consideration for all the bosses that you fight, it allows you to train for the actual final boss of the game. And more gameplay-oriented games, I believe what makes for a very good final boss battle is that you're able to use a lot of the skills that you learn throughout the game, even the skills that the game doesn't outright teach you, and is actively having you pay attention to what the bosses are doing. Even going so far from the first boss, Wolf, there are elements in that boss fight that you have to take into consideration in order to actually manage to defeat Armstrong. Wolf is an interesting case, as if you keep an eye on the boss, you'll notice that his startup animations are the key to fighting him. Wolf being the first actual boss outside of Metal Gear Ray is probably the best boss to start off with, since keeping an eye on your opponent's animations is key. It's probably the best lesson to take, and it leads up to Armstrong, where you need to pay attention to his animations which are more difficult to tell apart from each other with their subtle differences. Like I said, the differences can allow you to predict how to counter or dodge his attacks, which include punching, blasting into the ground so that way you can create a huge fire hazard, and, you know, knocking your sword away. The second boss, Mistral, has scripted blade mode portions that allow Ryan to slice and dice her weapon or additional arms off. Armstrong has a similar scripted blade mode section where you need to target his arms, and there's another part where the player has to manually enter blade mode in order to stop Armstrong from healing. Then we come to Monsoon. Monsoon's very frantic attacks require the players to have mastered the parrying mechanic. I mean, to be fair, throughout the game you should learn how to parry, and it's probably the easiest mechanic to learn in the game, but you still need to get the timing down for that boss fight, and tie it up for Armstrong's attacks. Sundowner is probably the most important one in this, mainly because Sundowner's defensive shields explode if you go in too quick, and don't actively use blade mode to completely cut through the specific directions. And when you come to Armstrong, you'll have to deal with him throwing debris, but like other aspects, Armstrong takes us to another level since you have to do it at different angles and do it multiple times in a row. And all the while, your energy is depleting. Wake up! And finally, Jetstream Sam. Sam's boss battle is one you need to play defensively, as Sam will oftentimes block your attacks and will take advantage of your over-eagerness to attack him. Hell, unlike other bosses, Armstrong doesn't seem to react to being hit by you, and even if you manage to get a few hits in, Armstrong's HP is thick enough that he can take a lot of hits and hit you right back if you're not skilled enough. Armstrong, as a boss mechanically, is what a final boss should be, a test of all the skills that the previous bosses had. The final exam, as it were. Throw in the presentation and music choice, and as a final boss, Stephen Armstrong is number one. When it comes to the music, well, it's obvious there's a symbolism for the battle between him and Raiden. It has to be this way as a representation of the battle between Raiden and Armstrong, two men who understand each other's motives and how it comes off as an apology or regret that they have to fight each other. You have two men who are willing to fight for what they truly believe in. Armstrong's beliefs are that of social Darwinism, where the strong can thrive, taking their own destiny into their hands and pulling themselves out from the gutter. And that's exactly what Raiden was. If you haven't watched my retrospective on Metal Gear Rising where I touch on Raiden's character, that's because YouTube's a bitch and decided to make it so people can't actually find the original video, so I had to re-upload it. Please watch that. I talked about Raiden's character and how he was essentially a child soldier, and made into a puppet for various organizations, until he took his own life into his hands and fought back. In a sense, that's what Armstrong wants. He's actually sad that a talented man like Raiden refuses to join him. And this is where we switch to talking about Armstrong as a character. 
Hmm. Cherry blossoms. Yeah. I take it you're not a fan? No. They make me sick. Is it really so horrible? They're only trees. They go from full blossom to bare in a week. One fucking week. Everywhere in DC you hear, oh, it's so fleeting and beautiful. Pathetic. Let's face it, one of the big reasons that Armstrong is so beloved, even to the point where to this day, people are still making compilation videos of Metal Gear Rising is because he's so mimetic. And hey, I love a villain who can easily ham up a scene while at the same time being a threat to the main character. I can appreciate that even if a villain is funny, that doesn't detract from their abilities and doesn't make them look like complete washouts. It's kind of a problem I have with some villains nowadays in our modern media. Ugh. Armstrong, on the other hand, if you actually listen to him and consider his actions in both the main game and the Jetstream Sam DLC, yes, what Armstrong is doing is wrong. I mean, you'd have to have your own brain scooped up with an ice cream scooper to think that taking kids off the street, turning them into heartless killing machines, isn't exactly what you'd call the thing the good guys would do. But if you're able to see what Armstrong is after, he's aiming to create a new America where the strong survive and thrive and the weak die off. It's similar to what the Patriots did in the previous Metal Gear Solid games, only instead of using information, Armstrong would rather do it with giant robots and a nanomachine covered fist. Armstrong was actually a pretty brilliant commentary on politicians, or at the very least the perception that the average Joe would have on politicians. When you first meet Armstrong, he comes off as the stereotypical politician. It's part of the reason why he has a yellow tie instead of the standard blue or red of political parties. Armstrong is meant to be a commentary on politicians and their hidden motivations. When you first meet with Armstrong in real time, he admits to being a neo-patriot. He wants to restart the war economy to maintain America's willpower status, but like any good politician, he keeps what his true goals are to be hidden. It's a smokescreen until Ryan points it out. And as it turns out, Armstrong hates politics. War corporate shilling, and the current internet culture. In a sense, Armstrong hates all that stuff because it's been used to take away people's freedoms. It's the shallow materialistic culture that he originally claimed to support, but honestly, it disgusts him. And frankly, looking at today's culture, I can't really blame anyone for viewing it that way. Armstrong is playing to his stereotype and is actively using it to destroy the things that prop people like him up, or his stereotype up. And in a sense, one can even view Armstrong as a hypocrite. Even Raiden calls him out since Armstrong never had to really suffer and lived a privileged life. And here's the thing, Armstrong doesn't deny this, but he doesn't see himself as a hypocrite for what he's doing. While Armstrong hasn't actually experienced the hardships that most people will in life and he is a privileged politician, it was the struggles and segregation of innocent lives that drove him into his heinous actions of corruption. Armstrong has a dream. Can't fret over every egg! It's unfortunate that dream is social Darwinism. When I made my video talking about the bosses of Metal Gear Rising, I brought up Darwin when talking about Metal Gear Ray in the evolution of combat. This is a similar vein. Armstrong sees the corruption within his own country. In a sense, if you boil down Armstrong's motives, he wants to remove the corruption of America. But it's become so deep-seated that it's nearly impossible to save in his eyes. He doesn't want there to be people like his stereotypical smokescreen to be there. They just make the system worse. He oddly enough wants people like Raiden, those who had to struggle and claw their way up to the top in order to maintain their positions. Those are the people that Armstrong wants to be in his new America. Not the fat cats that only care about lining their own pockets and not caring about the people that they step on in the progress, the people that they say that they care about but actively don't. No more complacency or having a direct reliance on the government to fix your issues. That is what Armstrong wants to accomplish. He wants to temper the American people, like a sword being forged through fire to become strong, and only through conflict can he see that being the way to do it. He honestly really respects people like Raiden and Jetstream Sam. They're men who struggled to get where they were, training endlessly and didn't take the easy way out when they had the chance. Armstrong isn't unaware of the fact that his goals are going to hurt and even kill innocent people, but if the status quo of the current government remains, those people would still be doomed to this life and be forced to suffer because of limp dick lawyers and chicken shit bureaucrats. That is Armstrong's goal and argument. The point of his character is to show that the noble evil types aren't set to come from certain backgrounds. Armstrong has always been in a position of power, but has a lot of integrity that would put some of Ryan's allies to shame. I'll say it again, what Armstrong is doing is evil, his methods certainly are. 
But depending on who you are and how much you believe in social Darwinism or that might makes right, you might actually see where he's coming from to a degree. I mean, he's not wrong about the internet. And he's not wrong about the corruption either. Hell, just ask anyone from any political party and I'm sure they'll tell you how much of a politicians they don't like and are actively corrupt in their eyes. Armstrong puts a lot of emphasis on freedom, a land where anyone can mold their own destiny without the red tape that gets in the way of the progress. People like Armstrong can come from anywhere, a man who doesn't apologize for his actions and believes that what he's doing is for the greater good. Even if you disagree with his methods, there are things that can make you nod your head because you can agree with stuff like how our society has become superfluous and much more saturated and pointless crap. <laughs> the point of Armstrong is to challenge your perceptions, your views, and get you to think. Metal Gear Rising is a very mimetic game and has some very funny moments. But it isn't to say that it can't have a deep message. It's just that it's buried under the goofiness, the high-octane action, and the kick-ass music. It's why I love the game. That has a deeper meaning if you want to look, but it doesn't get in the way of you having a good time. It knows what it is, and it's a dumbass game where you have a cyborg slicing up people for points in a rank. And because it knows what it is, it can actually say something without being blared in your face like a lot of today's media. Granted, to point something out about Armstrong, You're batshit insane! What you say to me, ah! shit? Another aspect that's fascinating about Armstrong is that he truly respects those who take control of their own destinies. I know I stated earlier, but Ryan and Jetstream Sam are people that Armstrong respects. They're strong individuals who he'd love to have in his future America. You can tell this in both his interaction with Ryan and Sam. With Sam, Armstrong actually wants to have Sam come in and test the swordsman. It was an arrangement that Armstrong and Monsoon had arranged to recruit him and basically set up an interview. It was because Sam had a very good track record and showed that he was able to take out several drug cartels single-handedly. Such talent should not be wasted. Even while pounding Sam's head into the concrete, even after Sam slices off Armstrong's arm, and with that confident smile, Armstrong never stops trying to recruit Sam. Even to the point when Armstrong cuts off Sam's own arm, he has a deep respect for these kinds of people. Hell, during their fight, when Ryan gets his ass hand to him, he says this. Maybe I was wrong about Maybe you. I misjudged you. You can instantly see that Armstrong is quick to offer Ryan a hand in solidarity, even going so far to give Ryan a hug. Of course, when that happens, it gives Ryan a chance to get in a quick shot at Armstrong, but the point is that Armstrong respects people like Ryan and Sam. And while they can be pains in his ass, they are people who pulled themselves up from the ground, and that's what Armstrong respects about them. Of course, just because he respects them, that doesn't mean he'll go easy on them during their fights. Armstrong may be insane, but it's not that hard to see that there's a twisted logic to his plan and character. Ironically enough, Armstrong's plan would create a lawless world akin to that the Fist of the Norn Star, save for the nuclear holocaust. <laughs> I know I brought this up before in my remake of the Metal Gear Rising retrospective, but I did warn you in that that I would be rehashing this point to some degree. So let's expand upon it. In my humble opinion, I believe that Armstrong is probably the best of the Metal Gear bosses. I've already explained mechanically why I believe that is in this video, which is a point in my favor for this, since I believe that a good final boss should be the final test of a game's mechanics. Hell, I can name a few other final bosses that fail in that regard. Breath of the Wild's Dark Beast Ganon, Final Fantasy X's Yu Yevin, Jasper Bat Jr. from No More Heroes 2, and I think you get the point. But more specifically, in Metal Gear, Armstrong is probably one of the more interactable villains, at least when you consider the story. A load of Metal Gear villains will often pontificate towards Snake, delivering almost endless amounts of backstory and context that I can't be the only one pushing the skip button just so I can get back to the honestly limited gameplay sections of these games. And that's more towards Kojima's writing style, which as an interview for with Metal Gear Solid 2's translator Agnes Kaku stated at one time, you know Kaiser, if you just want to read this part, go for it, I don't care. Uh, 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 okay. I don't think Kojima's a writer. The fact that he would even be considered one shows how low the standards are in the game industry. Nothing in Metal Gear Solid 2 is above a fanfic level. He wouldn't last a morning in a network TV writer's room. And while I don't fully agree with that notion, I'd be lying if it didn't have issues with Kojima as a game's writer and director. And since Kojima's still apparently working on projects, well... I guess we'll see where he's got going. 
I guess the writing aspect for why I prefer Rising and how it doesn't waste my time bogging down the game can be given to Etsu Tamari. A change of hands with a pen that writes the story can be quite the refreshing sentiment. Especially since, unlike other Metal Gear bosses, Armstrong actually has a chance to interact with Raiden and even debate him. A lot of the Rising bosses do that now that I think about it. I'm not saying that this is an exclusive to the Rising games, but Solid does have a tendency of monologuing to the protagonist till I fall on my chair out of boredom. I don't know, I just find it to be more interesting whenever you have your protagonist fight against the main villain and challenge their mindset or beliefs. It's just something that, so long as it has the right presentation and doesn't just have the character standing around waxing philosophically, I love. Or even worse, when only one of them waxes philosophical mumbo-jumbo and brings up a ton of fluff and backstory to understand their motives. Even when Armstrong is still putting on his politician guise, the presentation of the conversation is honestly a lot more interesting. Check the internet lately! The memes. Show me. How did they... I will always accept there being much more thought and energy put into an exposition like this. And while there being some pretty graphics on the screen is nice, I honestly prefer the characters acting like they're on a stage play. While I'm not opposed to a backstory or motivations being highlighted in interesting imagery, I honestly prefer this kind of presentation over that. I don't know, it just really humanizes the characters, it doesn't come off as a lecture. It comes off as a stage show, which is vastly more intriguing than just having a bunch of images float on the screen to me. Hell, the presentation even intensifies when Ryan manages to force arms strong out of his Metal Gear, and funnily enough, joins him on the stage, quote unquote. The two continue to discuss while they fight each other, so not only is there some high pumped action going on with Raiden getting his shit pushed in, but you're also learning more about Armstrong as a character. It's entertaining and informative about the character. Grant, I can say that some people be more often than not appreciate the choreography of the fight more than appreciation of the characterization being developed at the same time. I mean, I know I certainly did the first time, but it's because of that presentation and characterization that I can remember Stephen Armstrong more as a villain than, say, Saldus. Although, technically, Saldus wasn't a villain, but Raiden killed him anyway, so... It, wait a minute, Raiden didn't technically kill Saldus. Saldus just went brain dead and was killed in Metal Gear Solid 4. Ah! When we get to the part where you can finally damage Armstrong in a meaningful way other than just gently tapping on his abs, the presentation ramps up, and you get this kick-ass music playing in the boss fight, the Nally finally begins. I know I'm probably being a total presentation horror here for this, but presentation can be very important. And there are some very impressive shots where you get the cinematic parts of the fight. Like when Armstrong gets to attack you and Ryan raises the sword up to block and knocks the sword out of Raiden's hands. And then it goes all hand-to-hand -hand combat, with the music actually emulating that of Jetstream Sam's, with the lyrics of the song not playing while Raiden is unarmed. Seriously, that has such an impact on me, and now I catch myself looking for that whenever I hear music with lyrics and games. It's such an interesting trick to use with music that I wish other genres would do. It even happens when you stab the Muramasa into Armstrong's stomach and you're wrestling with him. And then... Armstrong's death. So FYI, he doesn't actually talk about his death or the beauty of it. He talks about his politics, so I'll just label it. I'll uh, title it... Meh. You little fuck. You've guaranteed the status quo will go on. For a while longer, at least. War will continue as an institution, as an industry. Men will fight for reasons they don't understand. Causes they don't believe in. But at least I'll leave a worthy successor. You, Jack. Armstrong's plan was insane, but considering the world's economy and how much of a slog American culture was, are we in a good place? Armstrong doesn't belong to a political party. His personal philosophy also makes speculating on him being right or left utterly missing the point. His personal goal is extreme libertarianism combined with a good dose of insanity. And yet, as he says, and as Monsoon earlier in the game highlighted, they passed a meme on to Raiden. When Raiden rips out Armstrong's heart and crushes it in his hand, Something that he does whenever he performs the Zandatsu to take the healing nano machines from his fallen foes, Ryan essentially absorbed Armstrong's ideals, acting as the motivation and stimulation for future struggles. Hell, as Armstrong lays on the ground dying, you can tell with how the camera pans showing with how Ryan is standing over Armstrong, it looks as though Armstrong is in Ryan's shadow. 
Armstrong really wanted to make America great again and give its people true freedom. But he did so by creating child soldiers, starting a war, and with his intent with the US government being burnt to the ground when he's in charge of it. Grad and depending on who you ask, the government today is already on fire. But Armstrong is a well-intentioned extremist, and in some respects, so is Raiden. How many soldiers did Raiden slice up to get to this point? The game even took some time to question this before Monsoon's boss fight. And while Raiden accepted his more insane side to him, it does pose a question. Should we sacrifice in the pursuit of a greater good? And is that greater good even a good at all? And if you're looking to me for that answer, I am sorry, but I'm just a YouTuber who's cautiously dipping his foot into political commentary while at the same time talking about the meme game with the badass cyborg who slices people up and steals their spines and left arms on occasion. My brain isn't equipped for these deep philosophical questions. I'm too busy wondering how the hell am I supposed to get gas out of my neighbor's car without them noticing me. But to me, Rising and Armstrong are very important to today's culture. They ask questions about our modern day culture, which even though this wasn't written by Kojima, still falls into the camp of HOLY SHIT DID Metal GEAR PREDICT THE FUTURE AGAIN? And sure, you don't need to answer these questions. You don't even need to think about them. Metal Gear Rising only proposes the questions to you, and if you don't take anything from that, you can still enjoy a frankly badass, if not slightly rushed, fun experience where you get to slice and dice people into sashimi. But what do you guys think? As I said, I'm a YouTuber, and I'm curious to see what you guys have to say about Armstrong, Rising, and with these latest videos, I'm trying to take a different direction for my channel, and for those who support not only this video, but my previous ones, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm Anga Common, have a nice day.